Nigeria's new president, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, has given the country a pigeonhole view into his plans for his first term in office. In his much-anticipated inaugural speech, he delved into the economy, security, corruption, and a unified Nigeria. However, the petrol subsidy removal announced by the president is what has got many petrol consumers in long queues at fuel stations, some hoping to stock up on the commodity before the subsidy is gone. What does this mean for the Nigerian economy? We'll find out. But also today on the program, we'll hear from Nigerians abroad and other Africans on what this new political era in Africa's largest economy means to them. This is Village Square Africa. I am Kemeni Amano, and I'm glad you're here. Joining our gathering today for our very first part of the com conversation on the diaspora is Alistair Shoyode. He's a former chairman of the Nigerian, Nigerians in Diaspora Commission. He's joining us from the United Kingdom. We also have Eddie Kiyokwa, who is not new to the program. He's a global affairs analyst and he's joining us from Dallas, Texas. Gentlemen, you're welcome to the square. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm tempted to just go in a little bit with you on the, you know, the field situation in Nigeria now, coming on the back of the announcement from President Tinubu. Uh, educate, does this surprise you? Well, nothing surprises me when it comes to Nigeria um, because, you know, as you know, it's, it's, a, it's a personality country. It's not about the policy. Uh, when people get into office, you know, they have to do something to either make their own statement that are, they are in charge. Um, I don't know why this subsidy thing has been like a perennial issue for Nigeria for as long as anybody can remember. Uh, you, you know, you, pro you produce... Um, you produce crude, you refine it abroad, you bring it back. I don't know whether this policy is about saving money on the foreign exchange because, you know, you have to pay for the refined product if it's coming to Nigeria. Or, you know, is this to give a boost to the newly built, uh, you know, commission, but yet to operate a refinery, you know, by uh, Dangote. So who knows? But they, I guess Nigerians are getting a taste of what they're going to see, you know, from the new president. So we'll see. Alistair, so what do you think about, you know, this eruption of long queues again uh, since the announcement of the removal of subsidy? Alistair, you're Niger muted. Okay, now we can hear you. Yeah, my organization is Nigerian in Diaspora Organization, not NITCOM 1. And on the ESOL subsidy, uh, actually the, the, uh, the outgoing president, the GOM president, Muhammad Buhari, has already had that inside his policy direction before leaving office. So what the new president is actually doing is implementing the information that is already available that from June 2023, the subsidy will be removed. And he has acted on that, but it was started and put in, into motion by President Muhammad Buhari. And of course, like uh, other people already taking notice of, uh, the first information that is coming out of Nigeria is the long queue uh, back again. And of course, when you remove the subsidy, uh, my my thought now is basically, as the marketers already felt, that the government is removing the subsidy, is acting on it immediately. They are now slowing that the distribution of petroleum product in the country in order for them to quickly gain as much profit as possible within the time, the remaining days of the implementation. And they're going to do that until when the government absolutely come down on them for creating this illegality, which already now is putting the government in the bad view of the international community, of the Nigerian people, and those who need this thing to implement their business and to live comfortably as, as much as possible within the system. Indeed. And for you watching, we are going to go a bit deeper into this a little later on the program. But uh, let's continue our conversation with AGK and Alistair on the diaspora view of the end of an era and the beginning of the Tinubu era. And I'll stay with you, Alistair. Uh, what are some of the assessments you're making so far into the change in government in Nigeria? Well, uh, it's something that, uh, again, the international community has been watching, the diaspora community has been watching. And you know, when we come to the issue of Nigeria, really sometimes Nigeria is a country of dream. When people talk about America, for example, is a land of dream. I always say Nigeria actually is the best land of dream. 
Now, the international direction of the president, and uh, President Azuaju Tinubu, is when, if we have to take into consideration indeed what have taken place when he was the governor of Lagos State, then we can expect Nigeria to capture the imagination and rebrand and reshaping and the development of Nigeria as a nation. Now, the key thing for Mr. President Tinubu to act on is to make sure that he find capable uh, international Nigerians, international meaning that people who are diplomats, who are savvy, who have the network, the, the brand awareness of who they are as Nigerians. And if he wants to extend his hand across party line as well, to find these capable people that will now become the representative of Nigeria around the world is absolutely key and important. Some of the ambassadors that are already around the world for Nigeria, he may keep them. Why? Because Nigeria now really needs to capture not just the economic value of the country, but the rebranding of the country, bearing in mind what the country is facing, either through some of our politicians that have, have cases across the world and of our own citizens moving away from this Japa syndrome. We need capable hand, people who are able to run the speed that Mr. President needs and Nigeria needs. The world are competing, nations are competing against nations. So we must not slow down where we need to get our image as a nation too. In discussion for economic value, developmental value, diplomacy, Mr. President must key into this and make sure that he find the capable hands that are willing and ready to sell Nigeria to the international community. Mm, I see. Um, Educate, I want to hear your initial thoughts on the diaspora outlook of um, President Tinubu's inaugural speech and the plans that he's made already. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, this, this is like a beginning of a semester. You know, you know, for the benefit of doubt, every student is given an A. And then as, as you get into the, you know, get into, into, into the program or into the courses, you know, you start to see those who are going to be A, B, C, D, and those who are going to drop out. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as some people who have watched you know, Tinibu from governor to where he is now. I mean, Tinibu is not an inspiring man. Um, he doesn't have the charisma, uh, uh, you know, for a leader of a very diverse country like Nigeria. Uh, and now you look at his own, you know, uh, health conditions. He's not even able to stand up or sometimes looks like he doesn't know where he is. So if, if a country like Nigeria is going to have a president, at least, you know, gives, you know, let it be somebody who can inspire, you know, inspire the population because you know part of the leadership thing is, is to make people feel good about who you're looking at when you look at you know you know starting from obasanjo to buhari to ayara uh, duat i mean who actually inspires nigeria and who actually when they speak you know you begin to feel like you know what this person is committed to the job or committed to making things better for nigeria so in terms of you know uh, Nigerians are abroad or home, especially those at home, because, you know, the people are abroad obviously have a choice or options. But for the people at home, when you look at uh, 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 Tinibu, he's not an inspiring man. And, and then he has a very serious health conditions that's not been, uh, you know, disclosed to Nigeria, which I think it, it is unfair because, you know, just like uh, his, in, uh, Buhari was always spending time in London, who knows this guy in the next 30 days, where is he going to be? Right. So whatever whatever thing he's doing, you know, again, I'm somebody when I look at my leader, I want I want my leader to inspire me, you know, by the, what they say and their you know body language, their physical appearance, you know, when when those things are not there, you know, it's just like uh, water under the bridge. And wait, I just you, again for clarity, you're saying that uh, President Tinubu as it is right now does not inspire you. No, he do, he's not inspiring. I mean, how, how does he inspire? I mean, forget his speech. He didn't write his speech. You know, I mean, people at that level they have speech writers. But when when you when you talk about what the speech is, you want to see the body language. You want to see the emphasis. Mm. Uh, you know, in, in in certain things, and that that's what people are, are really looking for. Not, not the speech as written, but the speech as delivered. You know, that for. You know, the people listening to say, you know what, I am I am going to join forces with this guy in order to get this done. I but, see. You know, I didn't say it. I never saw it even when he was governor and then how, where he is now. But again, I have said, 
you know, this is the beginning of a semester and every student is given an A. Indeed. Let's see what happens in the next 30 days and the next 100 days. You know, hopefully he doesn't go to London for medical checkup. He's, you know, he stays there. He travels around Nigeria to speak to the people because, you know, his election or selection, you know, what, you know, is very, I think there's still a matter in the court. But he should travel, uh, you know, Nigeria, go to the six zones and speak to the people mm. and ask them for forgiveness. However, he got there, whether by fraud, by design, I am your president now. I'm going to do this job. What do you want from me? That's what leaders do. And not the type that go, they go well. over there and talk as if they're in a cult. I, I want us to talk about the diaspora now. And Analyst, I'll start with you. What is the current relationship between di uh, Nigeria and its diaspora? Well, I think uh, the relationship between the Nigeria and the diaspora community is very solid. Uh, we can't shout away that the diaspora contributed, not just the economic value that the Nigerians in the diaspora have been contributing back home, but in this election, the diaspora community actually were fully participants. They participated, they supported their different ideological political parties, and some of them went back home to contest in the election. And so the impact of the diaspora in this new administration is absolutely key, is germane. It has attracted the opinion and the views of the Nigerian community outside the country to participate in the development of the country as well. So the bigger picture here is like we have mentioned before in some of our own conversation is to make sure that the governors, either from the governorship level to the ministerial level of those whoever are going to be appointed, and the president to not just see the diaspora as sideline, but to get them involved in almost all the ministries of the federal government, uh, from A to Z of the ministry, ministerial position board level, please key in and pick the best of the Nigerian community outside the country so that they will bring their skill, their expertise. Mm. And as we said, they really want to participate to make sure that our country Nigeria get better. I see. Um, Educa, how would you say that, um, you know, the current administration uh, can better position itself in the continental play, in the global play? Well, <clears throat> Nigeria, you know, Nigeria, by the, by the sheer size of its population, you know, uh, 200 million, you know, whatever that number is, it also, it's supposed to be the big boy in the continent, you know, you know, the idea of the giant of Africa, but Nigeria hasn't delivered. Uh, Nigeria, you know, ha in Nigeria brand is tarnished, you know, whether in the continent or uh, globally. You know, it's a lot of work that needs to be done on the public relations image of Nigeria. How, how is that going to be done? It's going to be done by, again, the, your cheerleader. Who has the biggest microphone in Nigeria? It's your president. And let him, whenever he goes either to the UN or the African issues, he has to carry that confidence, that body language. And, but he's not going to do it by forcing himself. If he doesn't have it, he doesn't. But he can drive a lot of values, you know, from people who are going to coach him. You know, one thing with the Nigerian leaders, you know, I've met all of them. I've met Abbasanjo, I've met Jonathan. You know, they think when you give them advice, you know, how come you know it? I mean, you know, no, no, sometimes your advisors are better. They, they tell them, you know, they, they tell you what to do, how to do it. Like, if, for example, if you come to America, you know, if you come to America, ask, look for the Nigerian who's lived here, who has interacted with, to coach you on body language and what to say, how to say it. A lot of them come here and they speak as if they are speaking to their village people. And Americans don't 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 understand that because the attention span in America is very short. If the first thirty seconds you're speaking to them, you haven't gotten the attention, you've lost them. And not all of them, again, no exception. No, none of them have been able to do it. I don't live in UK, but I have lived in America. I've run for Congress, mayor, I'm involved, all of those things. I'm not saying it's going to be me, but when you come here, look for the, not not, not a white guy. Mm. You know, I'm not all these people, former secretary of these that come to Nigeria and say, we're going to assist you. No, look for the Nigerian. The Nigerian have had a presence in America since 1918. So there are some Nigerians by birth and some Nigerians by naturalization who are Americans. Who know how to go in and romance this stone on behalf of their country of birth? I'm an right. American by choice. There's no likelihood I'm going to come back to live in Nigeria. But if I see a way to assist 
and support the Nigerian political figure because it's all about image. Right now, they I don't see. have the image. So, so it's important. So whether in the to... continent or mm. globally, they don't. And they don't make use of their ambassadors. Mm. You know, oftentimes the ambassador becomes your, your, your marketing, your salesperson. They're supposed to be the one projecting your country on behalf of the president. But the Nigerian ambassador in America, they are nobodies. You know, when I say that, with all due respect, they don't do anything. You don't see them on the media. They don't have the, the you know the you know the gift of gap. You know, when America is a gift of gap, that is you are able to communicate. Nigerians speak, but they don't communicate, and that is a very big challenge for them because when they meet foreign leaders, you don't see them speaking, you know, as somebody representing two hundred million people. Mm. I mean, Nigeria is one of the top ten countries in the world based on the size of their population. Absolutely. It's, it's, and and what I hear but, from both of you is the fact that, you know, the, the current administration needs to work on reconnecting better with the diaspora and community. And, and that brings me to you, Alistair. What would it take to reconnect effectively with, with people and Nigerians in the diaspora? Well, thank goodness uh, we, we have the Nigerian uh, in Diaspora Commission in the country in Nigeria. Uh, likewise, uh, for example, the NITCOM, the Nigerian in the community, outside the country, in the diaspora, are waiting for that board to be constituted fully. But apart from that, just like my good person mentioned on the other side, is to identify the Nigerian professionals, highly skilled, expert, who are living in different countries that Nigeria want to engage and have relationship with. As I said, the nations are competing against nation now to find funding, find investors. Even the United Kingdom goes around to, to nations that they believe would add value to their country to go out and sell their brand. So Nigeria cannot do otherwise, especially with the challenges and minor crisis that we have seen with the brand Nigeria. So we must key into it. And the faster we get on board on this ideology, marketing, branding, economic value, development, the better. And every nation has got Nigerians who are key and ready and they're expert, willing to participate and negotiate on behalf of Nigeria so that we can succeed collectively as a nation. The giant of Africa, just like we've seen some information coming around that some African leaders are trying to mediate mm. between Russia and Ukraine to bring peace to that region. Where is Nigeria? But again, we are in the transition period, but we need to become the number one, not just in, in terms of economy, but in terms of many indices that put Nigeria on top of the ladder. And Alistair, you're absolutely right about that because it would seem that the current, the previous administration was very much seen in the continental play, in the regional play. But when it came to the global stage, for a country like Nigeria's size, we didn't see much of that. And I guess what you're saying is that we're hoping that the current administration does more for the image of Nigeria on uh, the global front. But I do want us to talk about two things uh, before we wrap up on our conversation on the diaspora. One is the Jaguar syndrome, and then also what, you know, how, what the diplomatic and for foreign policy directions should be uh, for Nigeria. But let's start, let's start off with Jaqua. And for those who are watching who may not understand Jaqua, it's the exodus of young people from Nigeria for greener pastures abroad. Now, um, this is something that the current administration needs to take seriously because it's not only the brains that are leaving, but it's also the bronze because they are the people who work in our factories who do the jobs that people who are sat in classrooms will not do. Uh, educate, what should be the direction for this administration if he wants to deal with this? Well, it's going to be about job. You know, you, you know, job creation is what, I mean, people want to be employed. Yeah. You, you look in the case of Nigeria, there's a lot of default career. What I mean by default career is when you finish college, you, you know, as an engineer, pharmacist, and X, Y, Z, doctor, I mean, doctors are given, you know, they're going to be doctors. But, you know, some other people that studied economics and some other subject, you find out in the first five or ten years of their graduation, they may have something they are doing, but in a default career, i.e. they looked for an engineering job, they couldn't find it, and now they are Uber drivers. They are doing all that things because they have to support themselves. I'm not so much concerned about the people who want to leave. I mean, the percentage that I would leave is not the percentage that would have, that would have built Nigeria. What needs to happen is to have an internal focused, organic you know, rejuvenation of Nigeria. When these people are leaving school, I mean, there's so much, so many of them that are getting degrees in subject that has nothing to do with anything. So you have to go back and rethink, what does Nigeria need? What, what is that particular? And then when they leave school, 
where are they going to work? A lot of things, people are looking for jobs in the government. The government is not a very relevant instrument in, in economic development. You want to encourage corporate private companies that can employ people and then pay them comparable salaries. So that way they have a choice. You know, if a Nigerian still want to go, let them go. But it's not people who are living out of desperation because they can they can feed themselves or they can find means for, for their own family. So what this uh, administration needs to do is to really look at what are the jobs that needs to be created? What incentives? You know, econo you know, PhD in economics doesn't mean economic development. A lot of Nigerians have that. If that was to be the case, Nigeria would have been ahead. Nigeria don't have incentives to attract quality employers or quality corporations. When that happened was between 1970 and 1985. Mm. When the war ended, Nigeria had a lot of corporations coming in. Of course, that time, Naira was good. There were a lot of trained Nigerians abroad that came back. But shortly after that, when Babangidas, you know, submitted it to the World Bank SAP, then Nigerians started to be sapped out of the country. People started to leave and go back to wherever they, they, they came from. So how do you sustain that? It's going to be employment. Quality jobs, not ministry. Mm. You go to Nigeria ministry, you know, the, the productivity level there is less than 40% because the environment is not good. But they, so you have to encourage enterprises and then give them incentive. What are the tax incentives? that benefit employers. If you can employ this number of people in your own geography, and you, you can show that they have a salary that is at least above living, living, living wage. Right. Then what you want to do is you give them incentive. What is that incentive? Is it in its taxes? Is it in equipment? Is it in their real estate? Is it in their financing? So the, no government in Nigeria has ever addressed this. And right. the reason I, I speak to this is because, you know, I went to school in Nigeria. I studied before I left. And then, you know, I'm not in Texas. I have served on boards and commissions to see how the Texas, at least, let me speak about taxes, how they create jobs. It's mm. a lot of incentives. And those incentives are the magnets. That's why Texas today in America yeah, we'll, we'll, is the we'll most... See. We'll see how that goes. Uh, President Tinubu already has announced uh, the removal of multiple... Um, he would work towards the removal of multiple taxes for investors. We'll see if that's, you know, one of the ways that he could get people to invest in the country and, you know, create more jobs. But let me pick Alistair's thoughts now on the same question and perhaps what ways you think that they can, you know, keep the young people here, have the young people contribute to the growth of Nigeria? Well, one should not really deny people the opportunity to move from one local government to another out of the 774 local government. And why we should not deny the youth and whoever wants to move within the country. And likewise, should them deny them the opportunity if they want to leave the country. For me, as long as they leave the country legally and they move to another nation and they do not have the challenges of becoming illegal migrants, and which means they will be deported immediately. And again, if they actually do move, the value of the remittances that will go back to Nigeria would absolutely increase from the so-called $21 billion that we have on a yearly basis to probably $25 billion, which is an increase then of $4 billion into the Nigerian economy. If there are no jobs, then it is always good to allow people to move to find jobs, which then again create a new, new level for those who are in the country, hopefully for them now to fill in the gap that has been created because we don't have that many jobs in the country. How many people are out of job? A big number. So I guess the policy is for those who are at home, for the government, probably through the Ministry of Youth and Sport Development, to engage them individually as well. We have events, we have our program policies that have actually produced independent entrepreneurs, uh, individuals who go into sport and become leaders and become champions. All these things are available for Nigeria as a nation really to tap into and create. But at the end of the day as well, our leaders need to show that inclusiveness, coming together above political barriers to show that the leaders can agree on something that stand for Nigeria, for example, whatever it is they must imbibe and come together so that the youth who are looking into leaders to copy will be able to do that. As a mentor for me, we mentor quite a lot of people who are in business, who are going to universities, colleges, even primary school. Why? Because without having good leaders who can mentor people, mentor them in the right direction, teach them and coach them, then the country will continue to suffer because 
we are lacking in that leadership direction. So hopefully with the new administration across all level from the national to the state and to the local government, people will begin to feel it's not just about them, but it's a collective process that will for nation to develop everybody that can should be able to participate and do that. And when we talk about 200 million Nigerian people, uh, I, I tend to ask the question, is this 200 million Nigerian, are they 200 million Nigerian that can vote? What about the babies? What about those who are in primary school? So really the core value, the core number of the Nigerian people that we're talking to are less than 100 million. Yeah. Minus those who are out of work, then you're really talking about a small number. So please, we should stop exaggerating, talking about, oh, somebody is there for 200 plus million people. No, yeah. we should be accurate in our numbers. And then that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, We'll see what the, the census, when or if it happens, tells us of the numbers in Nigeria at the moment. But let's quickly talk about, uh, you know, pol the foreign policy language and direction for uh, Nigeria now. And then we'll wrap up on this conversation. Uh, you know, as, as you may well know, governments around the world now are beginning to bark and bite and are taken away from those we have traditionally and conventionally referred to as you know the the big guys when it comes to global politics and so as big as nigeria is it should have its own policy foreign policy direction and language that gives it that center stage that we all have spoken about uh here on the global front educate what should that language be you know public relations i mean foreign 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 I think we lost EDK there for a bit. I'll move the question on to Alistair. Alistair, what okay. should that language or direction be? Well, Nigeria has got the wonderful diplomats already in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in India, Canada, Brazil, South Africa. This key diplomat for now, the new president should not be in a rush to, to remove all of them. Let's evaluate, let's calculate those nations where Nigeria absolutely need to put her footprint in there. And as I said, because the branding of the nation within the last month has really been not positively been portrayed. So Nigeria, the government, the president need to key into selling, 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 marketing, marketing, marketing. The brand of the government needs to be repackaged and shown that this government is ready for the international community. They are ready for the diaspora community to come home as well and feel free to invest just like they would treat those international investors that are non-Nigerians. So what you're giving to the other investors should be applicable to the Nigerians, no matter because I'm black, because I'm Nigerian, they should not be treated differently because my name is Alistair Shirode or because my name is John Abdullahi Mohammed. Whatever it is, as long as they're coming from abroad, they should have that same policy direction because as I say, the biggest investors in Nigeria are not even the foreign partners. They are the Nigerians and diaspora. So our diplomats, our ambassadors, our high commissioners that are doing wonderful things from Rome to Vatican, we need to keep and support them immediately so that that attraction, and one thing that we have to take into account finally from this end is every nation has a budget and fund that they want to give out to other nations. If your country representative is not there during this discussion, that country will end up losing that capacity, that fund, that investment that should have come to Africa, for example. So we must find those people who are ready, willing, knowledgeable, expert in those fields so that they will go and sell Nigeria. They will attract this fund, these investors Indeed. to come to our country. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, I'm go we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'll hear your thoughts, AJK, and then we'll wrap up on this conversation. You stay with us. Welcome back to The Square. Thank you so much for your company. We'll quickly wrap up on our conversation on that diaspora uh, outlook of the new Nigeria. Still with me, uh, Alistair and ADK. ADK, I was saying that you give me your response to that question. If you give me a 30-second thought on that. You know, you know, uh, you know diaspora, I, I, am, I am of the opinion that the focus should be the Nigerian at home. You know, there are talented people there. They're just not being given up opportunity. You know, the diaspora thing don't belong to it. You know, I know when our passenger is to their dad back in 2000 and something, I think when, when you look at the local talent and begin to 
and begin to march away and, and you know give them what they need. The, the Nigerian, the Nigerian has a resilient nature. It's mm -hmm. just that the leadership is yet to recognize it. Uh, for for the Nigerian abroad, you know, if if he's a family man, he's has stayed so long, what are the chances they're going to you know, come back to Nigeria fully? Right. You saw what Buhari did with the finance minister. As soon as she finished her job, she, she ran back to London. Nigeria don't need two timers. Nigeria don't need people who are you know one leg in, one leg out. You need people who are going to be there, commit to Nigeria because they're getting paid. You see that as, as a challenge for them. So well. the diaspora should be, if there are people you want to woo because they have talent and skill, you go to them uh, personally. Edgy, Edgy, I'm afraid we'll have to end it now. I'm so sorry about that. But I'm sure we'll pick That's this okay. up again. The administration is just starting. There will be a lot to talk about. Uh, Edgy Okwa is a global affairs analyst. And Alistair Shoyode is the former chairman of Nigerian in Diaspora Organization. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time here. Thank you, thank you for having me. Now, let's move on to the second part of our, our conversation. I know we have a teeny weeny time uh, to spend on that, but uh, we've seen the queues here in Nigeria, and we want to talk to our reporter who's been on the ground. Uh, Perpetua Fasomi Peter is here with us, and she'll tell us what she's experienced. Where did you go, and what did you find? All right, so I limited uh, my movement to Victoria Island, Lagos. I'm out of way to be precise, and then at some point I went to Falama just to see what's happening around these places. But what I noticed is that the filling stations around these axes are selling at the, you know, approved official price of 185 naira. But mm -hmm. then some of them are also not selling, and I had to go in there. You know, they wouldn't allow you to bring camera in there, but I found a way anyway. So I was asking why they are not selling. Though they are selling to those who are in partnership with them, but they're not selling to every other person. So uh, they are saying that they are awaiting trucks. Now, mm. that's, that's, that's a filling station that has two branches. The other branch is selling. And then here you're saying you're waiting for some trucks. Mm. And I, I pressed for that. I got to know that they had DSS officials in their prem, on their premises earlier in the day. Though he, mm. did, he didn't, you know, um, volunteer any more information about that. But, yeah, of course, that. That, those were the things I noticed. But then um, back to... In some other places where I stay on the mainland, you know, I, I especially where I get my fuel from. I mean, even before now, prior to the inauguration, we had this suspense in the air about, you know, his policy direction, if he's going to stop subsidy or if he's going to continue. So even before now, uh, the price had already skyrocketed. And so in some places, the price is reaching as high as 300 naira. Mm. But for the places I visited today, 185 naira. Still the same. I see. But there are long queues there. Absolutely. I mean, especially the places where they are selling for 185 Did people Naira. tell you why they need, they had the need to be in those long queues? All right. Okay. I spoke to one. He said he's been there since 3 a.m. And I was like, why will you be here since 3 a.m.? He said because he knew these people are going to sell because they are close mm. to maybe, um, they are close to a particular office and they know that you cannot misbehave if you're close to some security offices because you might be the first person right. to be checked and all. I yeah. get it. Thank you so much for giving us uh, insight into what you picked up today on the ground. Thank you for having me. The petrol there, but let's continue our conversation. Suraj Oyewale is energy industry analyst. is joining us from Lagos, Nigeria. Suraj, have you had yourself some feel today? Well, my understanding is that Suraj uh, isn't available, but how about we take a listen to, well, it seems that Suraj is back, but... Uh, Suraj, if you can hear me, I was asking, have you had yourself some feel today? Not yet, not yet, not yet. But um, I understand, you know, it's been a very difficult situation out there. And uh, I've got, you know, I sent my driver out. And uh, I mean, it's not been exactly um, a rosy situation out there. Why is the removal of the subsidy causing the, you know, the long queues we are seeing? Well, not the removal, but the announcement of the removal of the subsidy causing the long queues we are seeing. Uh, it's not exactly something, you know, that was surprising, you know, uh, when when we talk about um, anything that has to do with fuel in Nigeria, it's always, you know, a very big issue. Um, people, you know, tend to exaggerate it. People tend to, you know, want to put a fast one and all of that. So it's not exactly, you know, unexpected that such announcement, just put, such pronouncement by the president yesterday, you know, led to what is happening today. Okay, and um, I would say, I would say maybe that would have been a better way of, you know, communicating that, you know. But I don't think, I don't think, um, I don't think, you know, you know, what happened should actually be what is happening now should actually be happening because. A lot of people are just, you know, overreacting to, you know, to 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 news that the public did not understand very well. 
Mm. What is the understanding that people should have had? Yeah, the understanding is this. Uh, the president is not saying that where subsidy is going yesterday or today, you know, he wasn't communicating anything new. It's been out there since even, you know, as far as last year, that by June, end of June, you know, there was not going to be any subsidy on fuel, you know, pricing, PMS pricing again anyway. So it's not, it's, it's been out there for a long time, okay? Uh, maybe people expected that this president was going to reverse it or something, but mm. it's not exactly a new policy by the president. It's something that has been out there. It's something that has been communicated right Indeed. from late last year that by June, there was not going to be subsidy on, you know, fuel pricing again, end of June. which is Absolutely, not you're, and you're right June. about that because the Petroleum Industry Act of 2021 did stipulate that by the end of June, um, the subsidy should have been uh, removed. But let's talk about the implications quickly uh, for the government and for the Nigerian people. What are we looking at here? Yeah, I mean, we're going to start with the government. Um, first and foremost, it frees money for government to do other things, okay? Um, you know, a lot of... Ultimately, these things doesn't really... I mean, this thing, to be honest, between me and you, I don't think this subsidy ultimately benefits, you know, the intended, only the intended people, okay? You've got a situation in which even the rich people tend to benefit from it, okay? So I personally believe that, um, you know, removing it frees money for government to do some other things in within more critical sectors like healthcare, like education, and all of that. So that's from a, that's from a government perspective. In any case, they've not even, even, be, they've not even budget for it beyond June, you know? Mm. So, you know, there was even no way it was going to be financed anyway beyond June. Now, that's from the side of government. So I would have expected that it should free money, you know, for government to, you know, invest in other areas that directly impact people, you know, the populace more. From the, but from the, you know, from the angle of the, of the citizens, naturally it's going to be some, some, some body at the, you know, in the short to medium term because, you know, everybody was used to uh, buying fuel at a price and the immediate reaction to that was that, I mean, the prices were going to go up a little, okay? Right. I mean, maybe not exactly a little, so in a lot of boarding transport costs were going to be, um, you know, we're going to transport fare is going to is going to be, you know, um, I a lot of people are going to start ordering, a lot of people are going to take advantage of the situation and all these things ultimately impact, you know, the, the, the citizens. I see. Uh, just quickly, based on the pros and cons that you have just, you know, told us, would you say that it was a wise decision to have announced it at the time that the announcement was made? Uh, to be honest, I, I really don't think it was the it was the president's you know uh, announcement that was the problem that was the issue because you know if you look at the comment he made you know it wasn't like he was it was just affirming you know what has been what has been what has been what has been in the you know in the news over some time but I think the media and of course the maybe social media the people picked it okay and escalated it and began to spread the news and that ultimately affected what you are seeing today. Okay, so maybe if I were the president, I would not have even mentioned it at all in the presidential statement because you know every line of that state, of that speech you know was going to be, uh, was, I mean was going to be amplified by the media. Okay, so I mean so maybe that was the issue. Okay, but I don't think it is the president's you know you know statement that is exactly the issue. But the way it was amplified, and uh, and the result is what you are seeing today.